you like animals? They're cute. They're fun. You know who don't like animals? Other animals. Jamie, pull up that video of a bear eating a monkey. Did that snake just swallow a deer whole? We gave a dolphin LSD and it got addicted to hand jobs and killed itself. Life is crazy and it wants you dead and nothing simulates this better than Rain World. Rain World is actually a game that I'd never heard about until I suddenly had several dozen people in my comment section yelling at me to play it. Bro, have to play Rain World. I feel like this guy would really like Rain World. I need this guy to discover Rain World. You should try Rain World. Play Rain World. I know! And what I found was an absolute masterclass in world building, scenery, story, characters, and complete and utter bullshit. Because despite the many things this game does better than probably any game I've ever played, it has some features that it would just be better off without. So, without further ado, Let's talk about Rain World. Rain World starts with very little exposition, with only a minor explanation for how you got here. So the only real place to start is the gameplay. You play as a creature known as a slug cat, and there is a sex joke there somewhere, but I'm not gonna be the one to find it. The base game has three slug cats you can play as, the monk, the survivor, and the hunter, which loosely work as the game's easy, normal, and hard modes. First and foremost, this game is incredibly gameplay driven, with almost nothing being handed to you. The tutorial teaches you how to do things like travel from room to room and grab things, and then and either eat or throw them. It teaches you this game's save system known as hibernating, which I'll get into later, and it even teaches you how to do this charged long jump. Now that sounds pretty comprehensive, until you realize that there is a 92 page long movement guide to this game. You can fucking L cancel. What is this, Melee? And none of this is spelled out to you. The only way that you can figure this out is by playing, which brings us to Rain World's most important mechanic, dying. Because not only do the animals hate you, but the terrain hates you, the grass hates you, the background hates you, the water hates you, your controller hates you. This game is like if Ori in the Blind Forest had sex with getting over it. Combining a cutesy character and in-depth exploration with making you want to fucking kill yourself. This this game is hard as nails, and sometimes it is completely unfair and total bullshit, and that is 100% the point. Because this world is trying to do one thing simulate an ecosystem. The game is trying to create the feeling that all of the creatures are already there and doing their own thing. In most other games, enemies aren't programmed to do much if you're not in their immediate vicinity. It's like when your middle school teacher leaves the school. They just stop existing. And even when they are, they're usually going through pre-programmed positions, idle animations, and actions. And no matter how difficult those positions are, it'll eventually become easy for the player because it's predictable. Repetition breeds simplicity. But Rain World has enemy AI moving for rooms around you. So maybe you're just trying to get some food and you come out of a pipe and find that a vulture's already flying away with a tasty lizard treat. That encounter isn't a pre-programmed moment, it's the result of the AIs coming into contact with each other. And that makes it so that the exploration in this game is constant changing. You can never feel 100% safe in a route through an area because the other animals are constantly moving and changing location. But what this also means is that sometimes your biggest enemies can also be your saving grace. Save me, Henry Kissinger! <laughs> Rain World has a very interesting death mechanic in that sometimes when you die, you don't actually die. I think they made a religion about a guy who had that mechanic. When you die in Rain World, the only real way to make sure that you're dead is if you're no longer seen on screen. If you're dangling in the jaws of a lizard with the game over text on screen, there is still a chance because you are food and animals fight over food. So if whatever's carrying you gets into a fight with something, there might be an opportunity for you to escape. It creates this interesting dichotomy where one second you'll be cursing whatever low-level predator just crawled out of the London underground, and the next you'll be praying for fucking Turuk Makto to descend from the heavens and save you. Get his ass, Vulture! Vulture, get him! Get his ass! Yes! Thank you, Jacques Sully. It makes the ecosystem feel more real in that phantom menace, there's always a bigger fish type of way. And again, this is never explicitly told to you except by playing the game. Plus, there's the fact that the AIs will frequently fuck up by like throwing themselves off of cliffs and slamming their heads into things. It makes them feel like real entities and adds to that sense of this being a real ecosystem. It also makes them feel a bit like Wile E. Coyote. There's also the fact that each of the enemies are unique and have their own ways of going about the world. There are scavengers who have their own relationships and communications and their own complex reputation system that can determine whether they help you or attack you on sight. The vultures, who are pretty much the apex predators, will swoop down from anywhere that there's open sky and grab whatever they can see. And when they show up, the other predators will disregard you and do their best to flee. To the point that if you get your hands on a vulture mask, the predators will flee from you because they'll assume you 
took out the baddest thing out there, MF Doom. But the best example of this, in my opinion, is the Gay Pride Lizard Gang, with each of the colors not only having their own abilities, but each having different temperaments and ways of going about the world. Some got way too into the Dream SMP, while others listened to Pink. For example, Green Lizards can't climb things, but are fiercely territorial, which causes them to attack lizards and other creatures that approach them. Which is different from the Yellow Lizards, who work in a pack, being able to communicate using the antennas on their heads. Where if one of them sees you, then all of them now know where you are. Which is different from the White Wizards. White Wizards. Gandalf! Which is different from the White Lizards, who crawled out of the pits of hell. Fuck these things. Which means in situations where more than one color is present, you need to account for the different abilities and behaviors and plan accordingly. However, while these aspects are what make the game unique, it's also what turns people off of this game. It's what leads to the harsh difficulty and outright unfair scenarios that can only be called total bullshit. And I did say this game has flaws, but this is not one of them. If you're frustrated with the game for being unfair, that's not the game's fault. That's yours for misunderstanding what it is. This was me for about the first five hours of playing this game. I was miserable because I thought it was a 2D adventure game, but it's not. It's an immersive sim. An immersive sim is, to give a short definition, a game that presents the player with an objective or goal, and then gives them multiple systems that work together as tools to meet that goal or objective. There is no correct way to beat a challenge so long as you get past it. And once you finally begin to view the game like this, the world truly opens up for you. For example, if a lizard's coming at you, you could try to outrun it or even fight it. Or you could bait it through a tube and then come back through to where you already were, passing the lizard in the middle and leaving it in the other room and it won't follow you back through because the AI technically didn't see you. Those spears that you've been using as weapons can also be thrown into walls and floors and can be used as poles to grab onto for extra reach. You need to learn to improvise and change on the fly because the game certainly is. Okay, can I get a person or a location or an occupation. Ah! This game uses its difficulty to communicate one crucial fact. It does not care about you. But more importantly, that you are just another part of this ecosystem. And it does this absolutely masterfully by giving you ludicrous situations, but giving you more tools than you realize to handle them. Also, I said ludicrous, so I have to bring up that ludicrous takes a Pontiac to space in F9. This movie is fucking insane. However, just because I can admit that the game's difficulty and occasional unfairness aren't flaws of the game, doesn't mean that I think the game is flawless. For example, whoever designed this game's map is evil, plain and simple. Every room in the game is already connected through a series of pipes, which already opens the doors to some fucked up connections. But what I'm talking about specifically is what the map looks like in game. Why the fuck is it on three layers? It forces you to scroll through the different layers to figure out where the hell you're trying to go. To which I'm gonna get a bunch of comments that are like, it's not even that bad, are you fucking stupid? And to that I say, yes I am. It's a waste of time and brain power and I don't like it. But before I get into what this game's main flaws, I have to explain its karma system. Karma is the Buddhist and Hindu idea that basically states that what you do now will affect you in the future. I.e., you do good now, good will happen to you. You do evil now, have fun skinny dipping in hell with Ronald Reagan. In Rain World, karma is something you earn by making it to nap time without having your innards ripped through your outards. This is also how you save the game provided you've collected enough food. And this is necessary as every 13-ish minutes, depending on the character, it'll rain so hard that you get insta-killed. I'm singing in the- so your options are either hibernate and get karma or die, and let me tell you, one of those is much easier than the other. Now, it has other uses, but the primary use for karma is to open gates to new areas. This is probably the dumbest progression mechanic I have ever seen. Because the minute I decided to go to a new area, the game stopped being about exploration and creative problem solving and started being about grinding karma. I'm not playing the game anymore. I'm just fucking trying to farm karma. It brought the gameplay to a screeching halt, became unnecessarily tedious, and made me question why I was even doing this. The Monk has a better system where once you unlock a gate, it's now permanently unlocked from both sides, but personally I wish they just didn't exist at all. They single-handedly made my experience worse because sometimes the most annoying part of the game was progressing the game. However, you're not gonna find me dogging on the karma system itself because its other in-game uses make sense and because it's tied to the world building and story. Rain World is a case where the world and world building as it is now is tied almost completely to the story. So spoiler warning for most of Rain World. Rain World has a very interesting premise for its world, being a both literal and nihilistic take on several aspects of Buddhism, which is all about the idea of becoming enlightened in order to reach Nirvana and leave the cycle of spiritual rebirth. So in Rain World, they took that literally and you can just never die. <laughs> When you die, you just kind of get Groundhog Day and wake up where you left off. Psst, 
that's also their in-game explanation for save points. Like, a long-ass time before the game happens, there were these dudes called the Ancients, and we don't know a ton about them. Ah, better known as Senators. But what we do know is that they couldn't fucking die and they really wanted to. Ah, better known as Senators. So basically, the entire planet was trying to Heaven's Gate themselves and meet the aliens behind the moon. Which led to this interesting scenario where people were trying to shed their earthly ties and basically find enlightenment in an attempt to, in the words of Hamlet, shuffle off this mortal coin. That is, until they started drilling and eventually found oil. Did you say oil? This just in, the United States of America has begun conducting special operations on the planet known as Rain World after claiming they could possibly be hiding weapons of mass destruction, more at six. Well, technically it was a substance known as void fluid. Aww. This just in, the United States of America has extracted their forces from Rain World and Al-Qaeda has taken control of the region. Void fluid has a couple of uses, but the most important is its ability to kill people without them having to shed all of their earthly pleasures. Sometimes. Yeah, I guess they threw like Andrew Tate into the void fluid or something because there were some people whose egos were so big that they couldn't ascend completely and sort of just left behind a stain. Yeah, the ancients didn't love the idea of becoming a grease spot on the universe, so they outsourced the solving of this problem to AI. They built a bunch of giant supercomputers that would make Linus tech tips combust called iterators to essentially act as monkeys chained to typewriters for forever and waited for them to write Shakespeare, giving them the goal of trying to find a portable and mass applicable way of ascending every living thing on the planet. A byproduct of these iterators is that they got really hot and needed a ton of water to cool themselves down, otherwise they would like melt into toxic sludge. And so those massive amounts of water would evaporate and eventually come down as incredibly heavy rainfall. Which is such cool reasoning for why the rain is as heavy and dangerous as it is, and is just phenomenal world building, parentheses he says in an aside to the audience. But the ancients realized that forever is a very long time, so they all fucked off and left a bunch of supercomputers solving what came to be known as the Great Problem. However, the iterators also gave themselves the mission of trying to find a way to ascend themselves. Except that all the iterators are designed specifically to be unable to self-terminate. For the purposes of this video, there are three iterators who matter for this part of the story. Sliver of Straw, Five Pebbles, and Looks to the Moon. Yes, they are all named like middle school furries. When the iterators were first being built, originally they needed to be spaced apart because they each needed their own water sources. However, once the rain began, the ancients realized that they could put them closer together as water wouldn't be a problem as long as the iterators ran at their normal temperatures. And so, Five Pebbles and Looks to the Moon ended up being built very close to each other, with Moon being built first and five pebbles being built after. This will be important later. At some point, Sliver of Straw sent a message claiming to have solved the great problem and then immediately fucking died. Five pebbles said fuck this and starts working on a way to kill himself. Using the names over and over again makes me sound like a high school gossip. And then Sally told Lisa. Anyway, it turns out that suicide is kind of unoptimized and the CPU began to overheat, so he needed to use a ton of water to cool himself down. Under any other circumstance, this probably would have been fine, except that he shared a water source with looks to the moon, who began to overheat and take serious damage. Moon asked him politely to stop, at which point he said fuck you and went Badlands Chugs on her ass. Moon then asked him less politely to stop, which gave him crippling super hemorrhoids, average Sigma male experience, at which point Looks to the Moon essentially died, kind of, but not actually, very slowly and painfully, and Five Pebbles still has super hemorrhoids. And this is where the world is by the time the game begins, and that's where I'm gonna stop. Now I think this story is pretty good, and is very well thought out, but I think what it does most effectively is set up the world building. I am a total sucker for depressing atmospheres, dead worlds, and lost civilizations. And not only does this game have that, but it has unique reasoning and logic for why things are the way they are. Suspension of disbelief is a sort of agreement that a piece of media makes with its audience. It's the agreement that the media will present you with a set of rules, and the audience will accept those rules, no matter how fictional or unrealistic they are, as long as they are consistent. The entire world of Rain World starts with the basic concept that nothing can permanently die. <laughs> And everything from that point on interacts mostly consistently with that rule. And not only that, but everything in the world domino effects off of that rule. Why was the ancient society so spiritual? Because they wanted to die. Why were they drilling into the literal void? Because they wanted to die. Where did 18,000 votes come from in the state of Pennsylvania? That one doesn't really apply here. Every major action that this civilization made was chasing that one end goal. And that's why one of my favorite pieces of world building is everything surrounding the iterators. Not as characters, but as these hulking structures and pieces of the world. The iterators are not only giant supercomputers, but they're also the planet's main climate control, being what causes all the rain. And on top of that, they're also the literal foundations for the main city, because once the rain started, the surface became uninhabitable, and so the ancients just moved on top of the iterators. And that shows through in the world design. The entire top right of the map is some part of Five Pebbles. He's so massive that he hangs over another area of the game called the Shaded Citadel, which is the 
the coolest fucking name for an area in ever, which used to be a sort of religious site, but now it's completely dark because it's literally been overshadowed by five pebbles. And it does give him a bit of a complex, but he's working on it. It's a physical representation of how the society shifted away from spirituality and towards whatever solution the iterators could come up with. However, with the highs that are all of that, there are also considerable lows. A lot of this world doesn't actually feel all that connected. Like, when you look at the map, the only thing that actually connects the different areas are the awkwardly arranged tubes that sometimes span inconvenient distances. There's not much sense of the fact that this used to house a civilization that needed to conveniently travel between these areas. Sometimes these areas feel like they're jungle gems that were created primarily to be jungle gems. However, this is just what I was able to gather from my own play through the map and the limited information scattered across several wikis, which only contain the most helpful information, like this description for the sky island which simply reads don't come here why would you come here this is the level of information I was working with, so if I have fucked anything up, please tell me in the comments. But speaking of that communications array, the scenery here is absolutely beautiful. Which leads me into one of this game's strongest aspects by far, its art style. First, let's start with the characters, because you might have noticed that everything in this game moves like the dudes from Human Fall Flat. Or party animals if you're too young to watch this video without subway surfers underneath it. And that's because this game doesn't use normal sprites like many other games, which are a series of pre-drawn images that are played as an animation. Instead, all of the animals in Rain World are rigged and procedurally animated, which means that all of this movement is being rendered and moved like that in real time, which leads to the unpredictable and, at the very least, interesting movement from all of the creatures in the game. It's a very neat mix of human-made pixel art and in-game animation that I thought should be brought up. But now, on to probably my favorite part, the scenery. This game has some shots that are absolutely beautiful and probably some of the prettiest I've ever seen in video games. I'm just gonna cycle through some of the scenery from this game that I really like. Just about every screen in this game could be a painting in my opinion. Some of the pixel art from both the base game and the DLC are just absolutely unmatched. They just radiate with this sort of melancholy that make me wish I could sit here forever and just watch the virtual clouds. It also makes me very upset that the Saint, one of the DLC slug cats, is the only one that gets snowy environments. I love floaty particle effects. I especially love how once you get high enough up, the game tries to give you a sense of how big the iterators actually are by doing things like having them fill up the entire screen or by showing multiple of them stretching high above the cloud layer. Most people probably love this game for the world or the challenge that it presents the player and look forward to overcoming that challenge. But for me, my favorite part of the game came in the few moments where nothing was trying to attack you, the food chain wasn't trying to prove itself, and you could just sit and behold the majesty of a truly beautiful game. Now subscribe and go watch this video where I talk about how Hollow Knight is faking perfection.